is power and purpose personified, walking towards justice, fighting for freedom. This is speaking now, empowering the next generation to know how to live with confidence and precision, to move with mastery and meaning. This is a spirit that is free, traveling one coast to the next, escaping the comforts of home. This is finding new friends and exploring the warrior within to destinations amazing, to destinations unknown. This is what it means to keep pounding, to cheer for the home team without hesitation. This is love and life, success and sacrifice. This is Yolanda Trotman and this is The Conversation. Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. Happy hump day. I hope you all are having a great week. Listen, welcome to the conversation. I am your host, Yolanda Trotman, and I am so excited as I am excited about every show, but I'm particularly excited about this show with this as I continue the personal conversation series. If you have missed any of the previous episodes, of course, you know that you can catch all previous episodes, live, uh, the live episodes on either the Facebook page or the YouTube channel at any time. And of course, at the website. So obviously, if you have not done so already, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Very easy to find at The Conversation with Yolanda Trotman. Follow the Instagram page, the Facebook page. You can simply type in The Combo Pod Show. All of our social media pops up. If you haven't already done so, make sure that you visit the website, which is The Combo Pod Show. Uh, This episode, all of our past episodes from seasons one, two, and three are up there as well as merchandise. And if you haven't done so, make sure you subscribe to the newsletters um, so that you can keep up with all of the updates. So if you haven't been following the, the personal conversation series, what the show or what this series specifically is about is one-on-one conversations with a variety of guests, anything, anywhere from musical artists to athletes and politicians and all of that. And what this particular series is designed is to take a deeper dive into that person. Like I said, a personal conversation. And what I have typically done with every single guest that we've had as a part of this series, we talk about their story. We talk about the impact that they're making now. We have a lot of fun in the process as well. So if you are joining us from the YouTube live stream, drop a comment, let us know where you're watching from because we can see those. If you have questions or comments for, for our guests, you can also drop those in the comments as well. If you're catching us on Facebook, same thing always applies. You can drop your questions in the comments. And if you have anything that you'd like to let our guests know, you can also drop that in the comments as well. So tonight's show, as we continue this series, we're talking about all things basketball. So for all of those of you who love basketball, who in particular, if you love college basketball and especially NBA basketball, our guest um, has has an incredible personal story, but also excited to talk to him, especially Um, with the recent um, announcement of the retirement of Coach K, because he um, is a former Duke basketball player and obviously one of Coach K's prodigies, if you if you will. So sit back and relax. If you haven't already done so, make sure you like, follow and subscribe at the Convo Pie Show. But welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. None other than the incredible Ricky Price. How are you doing, sir? Hey, what's going on? How are you? I'm great. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. So, and of course, of course, if anybody knows you personally, I'm sure they're going to have something to say in the comments, but definitely let us know as you tune in guys, where you are watching from. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing pretty good. I got a question for you though. Already? Wait a minute. Okay. (laughs) Was that you doing a cartwheel in the opening commercial? Yes, that would be. Yes. Yes. As a fact, matter of fact, yes. And while it was not the best form, that was not the point. (laughs) <laughs> the point was I'm in my tutu in front of Panther Stadium. That's that's just kind of what I do. So very, there's that. very impressive. I, I see you showing your athleticism. <laughs> something like that. Something like that. So listen, what how well, first of all, before we get into your story, now um for folks who don't know, you're here in Charlotte, right? And how long have you been in the area? I am. I am. I've been in Charlotte for a while now, since uh 2020, 2021, excuse me, 2001, 2000, mm-hmm. 2001. So almost 20 years. Yeah, it's been a minute. 
Great. So, okay. So for people who don't know who you are, or if they're tuning into the show for the first time, we I always want you to tell us who you are before we get into your story. Three adjectives. Give me three adjectives who that describe who you are. I can give you more, but I think I, you I get like get three. It. Stop being greedy. You get three. <laughs> fun to be around. That's not an adjective, Ricky. Yeah, it is. That is not it. Fun to be around is a statement. Why do I have to follow all these rules and regulations? It's not a rule. It's just adjectives, sir. Give me three. You're stalling. <laughs> um, outgoing. Is that an adjective? Yes, sir. That works. Personal mm -hmm. And fun to be around. You really trying to y'all yeah, go ahead and get him a thumbs down on that. Cause he knows good. And well, that's not an adjective. Hey, Michael. Hey, Ty, we see you. So listen, um, if we're, we're, we won't say fun to be around. We'll say extroverted. Can we say that? Yes. How about that? Okay. Okay. We'll go with extroverted. So where are you from? Like, are, do you have roots to North Carolina? Or are you from somewhere else? None whatsoever. I'm originally from Los Angeles, California, born and raised and uh, came out here for college and ended up staying out this way. And um, I guess I would be a North Carolinian now, but um, born and raised in, in, in California. I'm a California guy. What part of Cali? Grew up in uh, L.A. in the Compton Carson area. Not sure you're familiar with those parts. You know, you're more uh, you're more suburban. But, um, you know, um, y'all, he asked like he don't know. OK, anyway, let, we, we're going to let you have that. Keep OK, go ahead. Carry on, <laughs> sir. You'll learn. No, I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, <laughs> grew up in the Compton Carson area, which is right there in the in the in the framework of Los Angeles. And, um, you know, it was just. It was fun being a kid growing up in the 80s, dangerous during the, the heat of uh, of gang violence. But, um, you know, it was it was very fun to be to be a, a California kid. And so what were you like now? Well, before I ask you that, do you have siblings? Only child. OK. And so what were you like growing up as a kid? Um, I was uh, I was a normal kid. You know, I, I love to be outside and play, you know, sports. Um, Obviously, this generation loves to be uh, inside playing video games, which I don't quite understand. But, you know, I was always outside playing sports. Uh, I like to be around friends and family. Had a whole bunch of cousins uh, since I didn't have any brothers and sisters. And I uh, love to travel. I mean, obviously, with my basketball stuff that I did in AAU, we traveled just about every weekend to different cities playing uh, uh, basketball. And it was it was always fun. How were you introduced to the sport? Uh, at the age of five, my dad put a basketball in my hands and I immediately fell in love with the game. Um, it was just something that I just had to have. I had to hold it. I had to talk about it. I had to experience it. Um, it was truly my first love. Mm. And so did you were you did you watch the sport at all before you started playing or was it just your dad introduced you to it and you got into the typical leagues and all of that? Well, once he put the ball in my hands, I mean, I just I, I wanted to just watch every game. Obviously, I'm growing up in Los Angeles in the heat and the, um, at, at, the, at the time when Magic Johnson and Showtime, you know, was at its at its peak. And mm -hmm. so uh, I grew up in that generation and I love to watch the game. And still to the day, I mean, the playoffs are on now and I'm watching every game. I just love love the game, period. And so did you, were there any other sports that you were interested in other than basketball, other than basketball or was that, that was your love? That's a good question. Um, baseball. I love baseball as well. And I was really good at baseball, I played pitcher in third base and center field. And I took baseball as far as I could take it. Um, I was a little bit better at basketball. So I ended up putting all my eggs in that basket. But for me, um, you know, just being active and playing sports, I really wanted to play football. My, my mom put a, she put a, a Knicks in that real quick. Why? She just knew I would get hurt. And uh, I'm glad she did it because the longevity of the game in football is not as uh, not as uh, as long as it is in basketball and some of those other sports. Now, how tall are you for people who don't know? Six, six. OK, so were you um, tall as a kid or did you have the, the growth spurt? Well, my dad is six, five. Um, my mom is five, six. And so I got his height for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always the tallest kid in school. And, um, you know, I was hoping I would get to six, eight, but it just never happened. So I can settle with six, six. So you hit your 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 um, max height at what age approximately? Um, I would say in college, I grew an inch. I came in at six, five 
And then I grew another inch. So I would say maybe 18, 19 years old. And did you really grow the inch or did it just kind of, I no, no. you going to give yourself that half inch roundup that some Believe of us, some not, of us it did. grow that late. You know, guys like David Robinson, uh, Mike Dunleavy grew like three or four inches. David Robinson grew like seven inches in college. It's just crazy. So it depends on what that growth spurt is. But, you know, most of my growing was done in middle school and high school. But I did get one extra inch in college. And so through middle school and high school, um, were you playing for your school teams or were you doing um, more outside AAU work or was it a combination of both? Uh, combination, you know, any league, anything that I could play, I always wanted to play. My mom was very active in all my um, in all my doings. I mean, she wanted to be the team mom. She took me to practice. She went to all the games. And so she wanted to keep me um, keep me busy. And uh, I'm so appreciative of her because you know, I just thanked her the other day, like, my, I just can't believe you spent all that time, you know, with me, you know, watching all my games. She spent hours upon hours in the arenas, you know, in the gym, stinky gyms, small gyms, bigger gyms, any gym to watch her son play. And as a result, um, you know, I had that, uh, I had that steady foundation. I had that support that I needed. Now, what was your position? Where did you start as far as teams or, or did you stay in the forward? range or did you play other positions? Well, you know, early on, I was always the tallest kid, like I mentioned. And so I was uh, pretty much at the center position. I was the big guy, if you will. And then uh, I had an AAU coach. His name was Izzy Washington. God rest his soul. Founder of Slam and Jam, one of the best AAU programs in California. Um, he took me aside and said, you know, you're not going to be a center in college or, you know, God willing uh, professionally, you know, you're going to be a guard. And he mm -hmm. taught me in the sixth grade how to play the guard position and it changed my life. It changed my game. And as a result, I was able to flourish and and uh, become one of the top players in middle school and then one of the top players in high school and get a scholarship to go uh, and play Division One in college, which was um, always a lifelong dream of mine. And so in um, coming through high school, was were you were you the, the jock or were did you? Because obviously you had you were intelligent as well because you wouldn't have made it in the Duke if you weren't. Mm -hmm. But were you the jock guy? Were you the, you said fun to be around. So we can't, do we glean what that means? Or are you going to tell us? Yeah, I was always popular. I always had friends. I was always, I guess, in the in crowd, or at least I wanted to be, um, you know, but for me, it, it came hand in hand. You know, the word jock is, is a little bit crazy because, you know, you're an athlete. And so I guess because of that, you're supposed to get girls or, or be popular. I think I was already popular in, in some, um, in some regards. Um, but obviously playing basketball and playing good at, I mean, being good at basketball, you know, takes your popularity to a, a whole nother height. And, um, you know, I was very thankful for that. So you're coming from California all the way over to North Carolina. How much of a culture shock was that for you? Huge, huge. You know, I remember when I first got to Duke, people were uh, teasing me because they, they, they said I sounded like Ice Cube. And so, you know, um, what's up, player? You know, I had that, I had that, yeah, I had that West Coast mentality. You know, the Chuck Taylors, you know, shirts buttoned up to the top. You know, that was just me. And, well, what uh, year did you did you come in to do what year? So that was 94, 95. Oh God. Oh yeah, that's the height of, of West Coast hip hop. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Know. So it was it was what? it was Ice Cube, it was Tupac, and I'm coming with the with the whole West Coast lingo and feel and vibe. But just like I couldn't understand, they, they couldn't understand me. I couldn't understand them because, you know, people here were like, everybody, everywhere, every mm -hmm. day. And I'm like, what are y'all talking about? And so it took it took me about three months to get adjusted and really understand what people were saying. Um, but once I got to North Carolina, I fell in love with the campus at Duke. Obviously, I love the terrain here in North Carolina, the, you know, the greenery, the people. Um, it's just a great place, a great place to be, which is why I've, I've made it my home. And so you, your freshman year, you're playing D1. That's your goal. That's your dream. Was it, aside from the culture shock, um, did you feel like you were prepared coming in, taking on all that responsibility between school and basketball all at once? Absolutely. I, I have been preparing for this all my life. You know, I knew what the term student athlete meant, and I knew that I had to be good at both. And obviously Duke is a very tough school academically, and uh, I had my struggles at times, you know, there. But uh, what's funny is my freshman year, my first semester, I had all A's and a B. Mm -hmm. And my mom was like, 
are you serious? Like, are you really this smart? You know, that first semester, they give you that that fluff, you know, the mm -hmm. introductory level English, African-American studies. You know, they just want to kind of get you um, introduced uh, and get your feet wet before they throw the heavy stuff at you. And so I dominated that first semester. But after that, it got real. And uh, I found out how difficult academically Duke was. But, um, you know, I was prepared. Um, we had tutors. We had people along the way that could help us get there. And then, um, you know, in, in terms of the basketball side, obviously I was prepared for that as well. But I loved being a student athlete. I thought it was uh, I thought it was cool. Now, so for people who don't know, did you come into Duke as, uh, on to the team, at least as a guard? Absolutely. I came in as a guard forward at that time. You know, there was three positions. You had your point guard and your two wings. They're pretty much interchangeable. And I played the wing position and uh, brought the ball up some a little bit, especially if I got my own rebound. But, you know, um, you know, those years of um, of learning from the coaching staff at Duke, you know, really took my game to a different level every year. And um, I'm very thankful for that. Is it as strenuous as far as practice schedule and all that as we perceive or is it not or not quite like if somebody doesn't know we kind of perceive it's all all things basketball you might have time for the academics or you fit it in wherever you can. Average day, what was an average day like for you? Practice was very demanding. I mean, during the season, we only went for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, but intense and hard. And I think Coach K made it a point to make practices very, very competitive. And I would say even more difficult than game situations. And so after practicing with my teammates every day, I felt like playing in the game was easy. You know, because of the level of talent that I was playing against in practice and then the preparation that they put us through. But the normal day, you know, obviously you have class in the daytime. We always practice in the afternoon. So practice was always at three, three thirty. And then we finish around, you know, five, six o'clock. And then we have training table. And then, um, you know, if we had games, we you know, travel or, or, or play games. And so that's pretty much what the regiment was. And um, after you get into that regiment and get used to it, you know, you uh, you understand, you know, what's needed and what you have to do. And so tell us about Coach K. Obviously, the main announcement, the major announcement is that retiring after, what, 30 years? Has it been 30 years? 40. Thereabouts? Oh, yeah. my goodness. 40 yeah. years. And so what's, what was what the first time you met him was uh, obviously before you you know came on as a freshman. But what was it like the first time you met him? Because he was a legend, clearly, at that well, point. Well, my recruitment kind of happened late um, at Duke. You know, usually you get recruited throughout your whole high school career, they didn't really recruit me heavily into my junior year. Um, you know, I was a pretty good player as a freshman, one of the top, you know, players in the country. Um, I was a pretty good player as a sophomore, but really my junior and senior year is when I kind of excelled and became one of the, the elite players in the country. And so, you know, as a junior, you know, Coach K recruited me and we had conversations, you know, over the phone and um, getting to know him and the staff was, was really good. And then when I took my visit, you know, that kind of took me, um, took me over the top. My host was Grant Hill. And at the time, you know, he was my wow. favorite player. And uh, just spending, you know, 48 hours with him and watching him uh, walk around campus as if he was, you know, that guy, which he was, um, you know, it just really put me in a position where, you know what, this is where I want to be. Truly. Uh, <laughs> I see where oh, I have to call him out. My nephew says he's coached longer than most people are alive <laughs> right now, 40 yeah. years. That's incredible yeah. if you put it in that perspective. And so um, was there, was it uh, obviously Grant, as you said, was your host, you meet him. Did you feel, did you feel, have a feeling of almost being a little starstruck or intimidated or did it feel like family? Like, what was that like for you? Absolutely. I was definitely starstruck. I mean, he was my favorite player in college and one of my favorite players of all time. And to this day, I, I believe that Grant Hill was the greatest player to ever, to ever put on a Duke uniform. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to be in his presence, you know, to, to walk and shadow him for 48 hours, uh, watch him go to the gym, practice, um, interact with people and then, you know, stay at his house, um, you know, go out and, and throw a couple of parties with him. I mean, it was just it was a great 48 hours and um, you couldn't ask for anything more. And for me, you know, um, it gave me like the framework of what Duke was going to be like. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, you know, he was a great host. It was a great university. The, the staff was there and it just it became clear and easy uh, for me where I needed to be. What's the biggest lesson you learned from your time playing basketball at Duke? Basically, how hard you have to play. You know, as a high school All-American, 
you got to understand, I was the best player in California, but coming in along with me were three other McDonald's All-Americans. And then there were three other three other McDonald's All-Americans that were there before me. And then there were three more the two years before that. And so on my freshman year, we had, I think, 10 McDonald's All-Americans. And so you had to understand that you're not the best anymore. You got to you got to carve your own way in college. And so um, that's what I had to do. And so the biggest thing was being able to go and do everything at game speed, um, play as hard as I could in practice and in games. And then um, defensively, you know, I didn't play any defense in high school. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had to play defense, you know, in college. And, you know, I became a better defender over time. And I was so happy to get the night in 1996 to get the um, defensive player of the year award. Um, which is uh, which is pretty satisfying, you know, coming from where I was not playing any defense to, you know, becoming a guy who um, was able to win defensive player. And so that was that was pretty gratifying. Were you involved if you even had time? Because um, I'm, I'm obviously coming to your paddle in the background. We see it. We see it. Oh, you but, see that? Uh, oh, I see that. I see it, and oh. it's well placed, sir. You have it like right there, right over your shoulder. So well, I, I, mean, I, I see that. Oh, I see. A, we don't get to as a reminder. Okay, we're well, gonna get you. I'm gonna get to that in about thirty seconds. But okay. aside, but but, but this, before that, were you involved, or did you even have time to be involved in any other organizations or anything like that, um, um, other than other than your time playing basketball? I did. I mean, basketball to me was like a full time job. I mean, they're talking about paying players now, and I can see why. You know, you spend so much time with the game, and mm-hmm. we're not talking about UNCG or. High Point University. This is Duke. Don't throw shade. I'm not throwing shade, but I'm just that's saying shade. there's levels to this. And y'all, that's shade. Anyway, go ahead. It's definitely not shade. I mean, much <laughs> love to UNCG and everybody else, but you know the 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 stuff that we had to endure at that level was was crazy. And you had to have attention to detail, and you had to be in it at all times, and you didn't have time for distractions, and uh, even pledging, um, which I'm sure you're going to get into, was um, a bit now. of a distraction. But, you know, you know, something that I wanted to do and I was able to pull it off. And that's that's I I don't know if that's rare or not, but in particular for college athletes to be able to balance that where you fall or spring line. Uh, Spring 96, IZ. Okay, so that in the middle of clearly basketball season, how did you manage that? And of course, I know you want to shout out your frat. So here's your space, sir. Let's do it. Listen. We all know. They all know who they are. You know where to find me. You know what I'm saying? You, you, I know you're watching. And we got, we actually have a reunion coming up soon. So, you know, we'll be, we'll be talking about that soon, too. But, you know, the biggest thing about pledging while playing was you have school by day. Right. In the afternoon and, and maybe even games and then set at night. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking about, you know, 45 days of just madness. And I don't know how I got through it, but, you know, by the grace of God, I was on a good line and, you know, guys looked out for each other and, um, you know, I was able to get through it. But it was tough. It was tough. How many are on your line? Seven. I'm the tail dog. Well, of course. (laughs) I mean, at six, six at that point. Yeah. Well, believe it or not, my front was six, five. And so he was always trying to stretch a little bit and try to, (laughs) you know, so he could be the tail. I'm like, nah, 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 little dude, I'm the tail. I'm the what's your what's your line name? Inferno. Okay. Clearly, do we need a, do we need an explanation or it speaks for itself? I mean, you can you can say what you will. Okay. And so for those of you who for some reason don't see the paddle, he is a proud member of the illustrious fraternity Kappa Alpha Psi Incorporated. Will we get a yo yo? No. No, mm-hmm. we don't. No, we don't. No. Really, really, really oh, that's so. Di- oh, oh. Okay. Well, we just. Okay. That's you, fine. You see it. You All see right. it. Bro. You ain't gotta. You ain't gotta. You like ain't gotta, we see it, but okay. If I do okay. that, the next thing you're gonna be asking for old tapes, a uh, uh, step shows. And then we don't have that kind of time, Ricky. See all that. We don't have that kind of time. We, okay. I wasn't gonna ask for the tape. We don't have that kind of time, but I get it. You don't want to do it. That's fine. Okay. All right. So anyway. All right. So you are you? A, is that your junior year? Or what year was that? It's my sophomore year. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so um, when you, so coming into your junior year and your senior year, which you said those were the years that you really felt like you were beginning to to just flourish as far as a player is concerned. Um, what would you say the most, one of the best memories you have as far as um, your time as a Duke basketball player? 
Oh, it's so many. It's so many. Um, but one sticks out. And it's crazy because the story, the story starts from failure and ends up in success. And so I'll take you through it. Okay. Sophomore year, which actually was my best year at Duke. And um, we're playing against Carolina. My which, by the way, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I disclaimer for those of you who are watching, because I know you're like, you got a Duke play on the show. I am a loyal Carolina fan, but we Ricky exactly. and I are still I friends. Never, I never knew that. Oh, I you didn't know that? that. No, didn't oh, know that. announcement. But yeah, I've always been a well, Carolina we, we, fan. We gotta we gotta change that. We gotta change that. Well, it hadn't changed since I was eight. So that don't mean know. it can't be changed. R right. Anybody okay, well, okay, that's fine. But yeah. I'm a Carolina fan. I mean, I got love for Duke, but I'm a Carolina fan. So you do, you do, you know, fans that are watching, y'all still stay. It's all good. All right. So anyway, you were, you were saying, so um, you said from trying or from disappointment to trying, let's talk. Yes. So sophomore year at, at Carolina. Um, at the Carolina game. At the Carolina game. Obviously we're playing okay. at Carolina at Carolina. And the game was highly contested, went down to the wire. Five seconds left. Never forget, my point guard, Wojo, has the ball at the top of the key. He penetrates. He kicks to me on the right wing. Shot fake, one dribble pull up, and I let it fly. It was straight as an arrow, but it was short. So I missed a game-winning shot to beat Carolina at Carolina. And what's funny is because, you know, I thought the shot was going to go in, but then at the last minute it was short. And I remember, you know, putting my hand on my knees and then they panned away and they showed Vince Carter. He had his hands up in the, in the air, like celebrating as if they won. It was crazy. I remember being in the, in the locker room in the shower and water's just drain, you know, dripping down my head. And I'm saying to myself, if I ever get an opportunity to hit a game winning shot, I'm going to knock it down. Hmm. Listen, I can't make this stuff up. Two weeks later at Maryland, same situation. This time I'm on the left side of the floor. Wojo has the basketball. He kicks to me from three, three, two, one, and all net. And the ball goes in and we beat Maryland at the buzzer. And so what I try to tell kids all the time, you know, that I work with and people, you know, when I do motivational speaking is that it's not where you start, it's where you finish. You know, and if you stick with it and you, and you stay confident in you, when your opportunity presents itself again, you can, you can knock it down which is exactly what I did. And so, like I said, it started from, I guess, ashy to classy, if you will. Okay. Okay. And so now you're finished and you are making your way to the league. Uh, for people who don't know, what was that journey like? Um, were you recruited prior to your senior year? Well, my professional career was kind of unconventional. Um, okay. You know, my senior year, there was a lockout. And so there, there was a draft, but there was no season until late in the oh, season. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. So that, was okay. in, uh, that was in 98. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I wasn't drafted. And so I had to make the NBA as an undrafted free agent. And the closest I um, the closest that I made it was with Detroit. Um, I was in their training camp and um, 48 hours before opening night. I never forget this. 48 hours before opening night, Joe Dumars, who's the general manager, calls me. And anytime you get a, a, a phone call in your hotel room after eight o'clock and you're trying to make a team, it's not it's not going to be good. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, he told me uh, and I had made through all the whole preseason. So I played in eight preseason games. I had played in all the games. And I mean, I just knew that I was going to be there on opening night. Mm -hmm. And so um, he calls me and says, you know, Ricky, you know, we're, we're going to have to let you go. And it was like it was a crush to my soul, you know, that uh, that they were doing that. And obviously it was a numbers game. I was a wing player. They needed a point guard. And so I got caught in the numbers game. But um, it was one of those situations where I was so, so close to making it to opening day. And even though you played in the preseason, you, you played in the NBA, but it's different when you're there the whole year and you have that 10, 15 year career. And so, uh, you know, I transitioned. And I had a couple of opportunities, but I pretty much transitioned to playing overseas for the next nine years, which is a healthy alternative, but it's not the big enchilada that you want. And mm -hmm. so, um, but, um, you know, my journey as a basketball player was so gratifying from the countries that I was able to play in to the players that I was able to play against 
to the levels that I was able to play college pro. And, um, you know, I wouldn't trade, I wouldn't trade that life uh, for anything. Who did you play for overseas for people who don't know? Um, two years in France, um, Slovenia, Amsterdam, uh, China, uh, you name it, passport full of stamps. And that's the gratifying part about playing basketball, especially overseas. Is you get to see these places you probably would never get a chance to see, you know, had you not been playing professional basketball. And so, uh, you know, I had a chance to have my mom come over and spend some time with me and travel all over Europe. And, and um, it was just it was great. It was great. Favorite country that you spent that you played for? Ooh, I would say uh, I would say the Philippines. The Philippines does really? a nice, uh, four month league uh, that I played in. that was really good. I like it because it's only four months. Usually when you play in Europe, you have to be gone, you know, six to nine months, which is a grind. But the four month league in the Philippines and the Philippines is very, very Americanized, Westernized. I'm talking Fridays, Bubba Gumps. Chili's, you know, all the rest in the Philippines. In the Philippines. Oh, we sleeping on it. Well, oh, the Philippines. Okay, who knew? I'm talking tropical, everything, 90 degree every day. I had my own driver. Um, stayed in the you know, penthouse suite in the condo. I mean, it was it was nice. It was a good look. Wow. And so um during that time, were you still playing? Were you still a wing at that point, or were you still yeah, yeah, my position okay. never changed? You know, um, I think now. Uh, positionless basketball is big, but then there were definitive positions when I played. You know, you had your traditional point guard, you had your two guard, your three guard, your wings, if you will. You had mm -hmm. your power forward and you had your center. Um, and now, you know, things are kind of positionless now. And so, you know, if your skill set is good enough, you can play, pretty much play anywhere. But then, um, you know, back in the day, as they say, you know, the positions were, 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 were really defined. So for those of you tuning in, if you have questions or comments for, for Ricky, if you didn't catch it at the, at the top of the show, make sure you drop them, in the, um, drop them in the comments. I can see your questions and I can ask those questions as well. Um, before we move on, um, now I also want to make sure that if you haven't already done so, make sure you're also following him on Instagram and, and Twitter at, at Game Ready Charlotte. We're going to talk about Game Ready in just a second. Um, but also important that you're following um, social media handles for him there. Um, in terms of best way to reach out to him. But if you have questions, most certainly drop them in the comments. Even if you are a Duke fan, it's, it's fine. Like, it's fine. <laughs> All right. So you're playing overseas nine years, um, other countries. I, I, do, I do have a question about when you're playing overseas. Do you feel like that the, the emphasis on basketball is, is, more, is, is as prominent there as it is here in the United States? In other words, are the players treated, you know, put on a, a, a bigger pedestal? Is it is it similar to what we, we perceive here or is it um, a greater emphasis on you being in that position in another country? That's a good question. I mean, soccer is the number one sport in Europe, you know, period, point blank. Uh, right. This thing over there, but basketball is a close second. You know, people overseas, especially in Europe, they love basketball. And as you can see, there's a lot of great players who are playing in the NBA who come from Europe. And mm -hmm. so the technical um, uh, work that they do over there with the players and the training that they do, you know, is evident. I mean, everything is tactical over there, you mm -hmm. know, shooting, ball handling, you know, everything is precise. All their players are inc incredibly skilled. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of the fanfare, it's the same. You know, the fact that I'm 6'6", six, six, long, lanky and black, they knew I wasn't there for anything else you know, <laughs> to play basketball. And so, you know, you got the people staring and looking at you, you know, asking questions, maybe asking for autographs. But I always enjoyed that aspect of it. You know, I love to interact with people who also love the game, fans who love the game, even Carolina fans. Mm, I like the shade. It's well placed. Well placed. <laughs> All right. And so what made you decide what when did, what made you decide to leave the league? And did you come back to the States immediately or did you spend some more time um, overseas before you came back here? No, I mean, I had trials every summer and that worked out well. But for me, you know, I spent most of my time overseas and I liked it over there. Um, it was a great situation. They take care of housing. They take care of your car. Obviously, you're well paid, uh, usually in a six figure range tax-free money. And so it, it wasn't a bad situation. And listen, the NBA is my overall goal, always has been. Mm -hmm. But for me, you know, playing overseas was a healthy alternative. Mm -hmm. And um, I just feel like, you know, that was a situation. 
and I, I enjoyed it and I took it as long as I could. And so what made you decide, okay, that's it. <clears throat> I'm, I'm done at least with over playing overseas. I think your body is the one who tells you that, <laughs> you know, your mm -hmm. needs and your body and this, the overall grind of traveling, going out the country, missing family and friends, not having the normal life of, you know, being able to get married, have married, you know, get married and have kids and, and, and have the normal life that most people have. You're missing that because you're gone so long focusing on your craft. And, um, you know, for me, if you can get a nine, 10 year career in anything at the professional level, I think that's pretty good. And that's about what I did. And after that, you know, the biggest thing for me was um, what's next. Mm -hmm. And this is very important. I want to talk to, you know, the viewers about this. Um, when you're done playing basketball, you know, most players or any sport, you know, it's tough transitioning to what you want to do next. And people always talk about, you know, I'm going to be able to do it, you know, when the ball stops bouncing, when the football stops, you know, throwing, when baseball. Well, it's difficult to get to what your next, you know, part of life is going to be. And so while you're playing, you want to have ideas and you want to have hobbies and goals that you want to kind of, you know, have for yourself when you finish playing. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to figure out and find who I was um, after finishing playing professionally. And, um, you know, I regret I regret that. And I tell people all the time, you should, you know, you should have hobbies and and, and things that you want to do. So when the, so when the ball does officially stop bouncing, you can transition easily. OK. And so did you leave Europe and come back to North Carolina or did you go back to California or did where did you go when you decided to come back? Um, I came back to North Carolina. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I just knew that for what I wanted to do for the next chapter chapter of my life, that it'd be easier for me to do in North Carolina. I just knew that um, people would know and recognize me because of the whole Duke thing, that it'd be easier for me to, you know, do what I wanted to do. And so I chose North Carolina and Charlotte because it's the biggest city, more city like. I thought Durham was a little bit more, you know, school oriented and more, you know, college if you will. Um, mm -hmm. Charlotte is, you know, up and coming and progressive. And I want to be a part of that. And so you said you've been back here since 2001? Yeah, 2000, 2001. Okay. okay. And so you come back to Charlotte, you make that transition. I, I want to stay there for a quick second because I think that's an important point because people have this perception of players and, you know, the money that's made and all of that. And they hear retirement is like, oh, you're, you know, you there's always an option to somehow be still involved with the sport. But I think it's, it is really important for, that people know that it is tough the transition from that lifestyle and all of that, especially when your body's changing and, you know, part of that um, impacts, obviously your decision, whether or not you're going to keep playing, what advice would you give to um, a, a college student mm -hmm. now that's playing basketball about something that you wish you had known then that you, that you know now, especially somebody and even high school, somebody that's playing basketball in high school and college that aspires to go to the NBA and go or beyond, what advice would you give them? Well, I think my pro career, especially one of the things that I think I, I messed up on was I was always chasing a better check or a better situation. Mm -hmm. If you're here in the States, say you work for Bank of America, there are steps you have to take. So you start here and then you gradually, you know, go up. And mm -hmm. so in basketball, it's the same way. And I was always leaving a country to go to another country. I felt like I should have stayed put for two or three years, build a good resume in that country, you know, maximize my earning potential and then moved on to an even higher or better country. And then did it like that, where you have, you know, a resume to, to really stand on as opposed to being like a, a hitman or assassin bouncing around and just going, you know, where the money is. You can still build a career in basketball um, if you if you do it that way. And I wish I would have thought about that more and, you know, did more of that, you know, as a professional, as opposed to just bouncing around as much as I did. And so now for people who don't know, you are giving back to the community in a major way. Um, founded Game Ready. Oh, wait, hold on. Pause. So a couple of um, got to give a couple shout outs to to Whit, James Whitmore. Um, Patrick, I see you. Adolph, I see you. Um, looks like a couple of your frat brothers are, are, are chiming in. And apparently word on the street is that you have a nickname uh, outside of Inferno. A neighbor of yours referred to you, didn't even call you by as Ricky. It was pretty Ricky. Is that, <laughs> enough, is 
having a fit in the everybody, face. Everybody always does. That whole Pretty Ricky thing is crazy, man. And so everybody always does that. Pretty Ricky, what they call them, you know, that, that thing right there. So, yes. Right. I have to own that because I've heard that more than a million times. All right. I digress. OK, so so now one of the things you're doing now in terms of giving back is, is absolutely working with young people of all age ranges um, mm-hmm. and found it game ready. Is it game ready, Charlotte or game ready? Well, it's really game ready skills and development training. I think that is too long. So, you know, the, the shorter version of that is game ready. And I think everybody knows, you know, our, our company is that. Um, and so, yeah, game ready. What inspired you to start the company? You know, I've always found myself teaching, working camps, working with young people, giving nuggets here and there, giving advice, talking about the game, sharing subtle nuances about the game. And so, um, you know, one of my best friends who is an assistant coach at Duke right now, Chris Carrawell, you know, he told me, he said, look, and this is right when I was transitioning from professional basketball to what I'm doing now. He said, look, you need to be in basketball. You need to be in basketball. You need to be in basketball. And he said it three times for a reason. And he said, you need to be working with kids and you need to be teaching. Mm -hmm. And it was like an epiphany. As he was talking to me, you know, he was he was telling me what I needed to do. And the next day, you know, I got in my car and I started looking for gems. You know, where could I have a home base at? And uh, I found Covenant Presbyterian Church and um, the rest is history. So for me, the reason why I'm doing this is because my love and passion for the game is taking me to the point where I want to give to others and I want to teach you, you know, how to get and reach all your goals and aspirations through basketball. And here in North Carolina, you can make a business out of it because basketball is king. All these kids are playing basketball. All these kids have aspirations of, of going to Duke and Carolina. All these kids have aspirations of being a professional basketball player. Well, they need someone like me to help you guide you through that journey along the way. And the parents appreciate that because um, at the end of the day, they're getting the discipline, they're getting the mentorship, and they're getting somebody who's been there and done that. And so they want they want to have someone like that in their kid's life. And as a result, this business has started uh, from one client to you know just about over 125. And um, we've been in business since you know 2011, and we're still ticking. And um, it's been very gratifying. I get to work in a t-shirt and shorts every day. And uh, I get to be in the gym, which is the place I would no rather be. Now, is it year round? Absolutely. Okay. Now, there are dead periods for us, you know, because because of league play and things like that. We slow down a little bit during basketball season. But right now in the spring and summer, you know, things are things are booming because, you know, it's the off season and kids are trying to work on their game and get as good as they can be. And then obviously, you know, we do our, our, our summer basketball camp, which is happening next week. And that's one of our biggest events of the year. And that's a whole nother uh, level of um, of training and skill set and skill development that you can do, um, you know, during the summertime. And so, you know, through training, speed and agility training, camps, clinics, you know, I do my motivational speaking and team building, all inclusive, all things basketball. It just works. I'm not an expert in too many things, but I know, I know basketball. And so um, the website is GameReadyCLT.com. It's on your screen. That The number to call is 704-931-8596. And that's where you can get information as far as upcoming camps. Super important because camp begins on Monday, the 14th. And you, do you still have slots available for um, any young people who are still interested in signing up? Yes. Yeah, so last time I checked, we're right around 80. So that leaves about 20 slots available between now and Monday. Uh, anybody who wants to grab those, please call for more information or visit the website. You can sign up there. And, um, you know, I don't like to pat myself on the back, but we do one of the better camps in Charlotte. Uh, very well run, very well organized, um, you know, skill development uh, deluxe. And we have fun with it with prizes, giveaways, guest speakers and all the things these kids need. Coming off a of pandemic, obviously, 2020 was a, a horrible year for everybody. Kids were in the house. Parents were in the house. And now that we're starting to open up, you know, people are being vaccinated. Um, you know, um, basketball is coming back to life. Normalcy is coming back to life. And um, it's, just, it's good to see, um, you know, things going, getting back to what they were. Excellent. So what's the age range of the kids that you work with? Uh, we start at seven and we go all the way. You know, I have some college and some pro kids that I train. So but the bread and butter, the majority of the kids I have are uh, ages seven to uh, 16, seven to 17. Okay. And how long is the camp? Do the camps have different 
lint time uh, different lengths for different age ranges or is it just one set uh, so we're going time uh, period? Monday through Friday nine to four and uh, we just get after it you know uh, uh, skill stations five on five games um, contests prizes you name it we're doing it and it's so much fun so um, you know I, I would I would really really advise you know anybody looking for something to do you know next week basketball oriented to stay busy you know our campus would that would definitely work for you I see a couple of people that are asking questions. So does the camp take you just from Monday through Friday or is it beyond that? Yeah, normally we do uh, multiple weeks, but coming off of COVID, I want to make sure that we, you know, we focused and did a really good week. And then in 2022, I promise we'll go back to two and three weeks. And, uh, you know, these parents think they're slick. You know, they want basketball, but they really want they really want babysitting. They, they really want child care. Let me drop him off at nine and not pick him up till four. Yeah, I think y'all slick. No, but um, you know, I understand. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's a there's a definitely a, a, a level of uh, of childcare that goes along with it. You know, we just love being around kids and love teaching the game. And uh, there's no better way to do that during the summertime uh, and learning basketball all day, every day. All skill levels. All skill levels. You know, I love beginners. I would say most of our kids are middle of the road. They played before. They're not excellent. They're not you know poor. They're just kind of right there in the middle, and they need that extra push. But I love beginners. You know, obviously, um, you have to start somewhere um, and the fundamentals are key. And uh, we're definitely going to be teaching that, you know, throughout the week and throughout training. So, you know, um, you know, it's it's good stuff. So I see a couple of quick questions I, I want you to address real quick before we wrap up. So mm -hmm. um, Patrick asked specifically, um, what about personal training for kids? Do you offer that or is that an option outside of the camp, either during the camp or outside of the camp? Yeah, that's outside of the camp. You know, that's my bread and butter. We do it. We're doing that each and every day, um, you know, four or five times a week for different age groups. So all he has to do is call me and uh, we can I can find out about, you know, where his kid is skill wise, how old he is and then put him in the right group where we can start working and getting him to where he needs to be um, and ready to go and play at a high level. And he actually has a second question I thought is really good because we didn't really, t I didn't, I, I didn't ask you this. Do you still have a relationship with Coach K? Absolutely. Me and Coach have a great relationship. I would say that um, there's not a, a professional decision that I make basketball related without, you know, running to buy him first. You know, he's mm -hmm. been a mentor for me for so many years. I also work with Duke Corporate Education, which he runs overseas, him and, uh, and Debbie K, uh, his daughter. And so you know, we have a great relationship. He sends me a birthday card every year and every time I'm on campus, which I'll actually be on campus tomorrow to get a few things and see a few people, um, you know, he's there. And so, you know, his career has been storied. You know, obviously he's uh, announced retirement. This will be his last year. And so, um, you know, we're excited about that. And it's going to be a celebration of sorts, you know, for him and uh, and rightfully so. You know, he's one of the best coaches in all of uh, in all of sports and certainly probably the best coach in college basketball. So. Well deserving. Outstanding. And so as we wrap up, um, two things now for people, obviously you, you can still go to, you said there's about 20 slots that are still open. If you, if they want to get in in next week's camp again, starts on Monday mm -hmm. deadline is Sunday. If I remember you told me correctly, this number, this nine, three, one number, if people have questions about personal training or to be able to potentially work with you outside of the camp, can they reach you at that number as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So that's for both for questions, all things regarding anything game ready, camp, training, everything is there. Um, um, you can also reach me at, at, at the email, ricky.price at gamereadysd.com. And so all the information is there on the site, but just call and uh, ask away and then we'll get you set up nice. And hopefully, um, you know, uh, your plans are open and, and free next week and we can get, you know, those remaining 20 uh, slots filled. Excellent. And so as, as I said at the top of the show, if you're not following him, make sure that you're following him and Game Ready Charlotte on Instagram and Twitter at Game Ready CLT. In particular, the Instagram page I noticed has a lot of videos, a lot of interaction. So people can kind of get a feel for the type of work that you do um, and the type of experience that they can expect that their kids have. So definitely if you have questions, I'm sure it's on the website as well, but slide over to, to the IG page because it's got some great information up there. So as we wrap up, so if we were in studio, I would get you to the so section. So the so section is where I ask you questions. You can't think about it. You just got to answer the question. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I'm going to give you a softball one. 
And I probably because no. this, this question is easy. No, no, because you know I asked you adjectives, Ricky, and you were like fun to be around. And we had to have a whole argument that <laughs> that's not an adjective. I, I was so not cooperating. I apologize for not cooperating. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. So we're coming out of COVID. You have unlimited income. You've been to multiple countries all over the globe. You can you you can, can wake up tomorrow in any country that you want that you've never visited before where there's no COVID unlimited income. Where would you be tomorrow morning? Australia. And it can't be somewhere you've been before. Why Australia? On my bucket list. There's a couple of countries on my bucket list, but I've always wanted to go to Australia. It may it may go back to Crocodile Dundee watching the movie. But uh, I've always loved, you know, I'm an animal planet guy. So I'm watching all the animal planet stuff. And, you know, from the sharks to. Uh, Not Shark Week. The, you yeah. watch that trash? What? I can't wait to watch Shark Week. That I is trash. How was it trash? This is I, good. That's another show. We don't have time for that. Okay. okay. So, so uh, Australia. Okay. Australia. All right. And so, second question. Um, who would you pick to play in your biopic? Somebody's doing that. Who are, ESPN is doing a, a entire documentary series on you. Who plays you? Mm, that's a good question. Um, you know, Michael B. Jordan is hot right now. So He's short. Put, he is short. So they got to put him <laughs> on like a stool or something. Put him on like a stool or somewhere, you know, they can just you know, get him from the knee up. <laughs> <laughs> on a stool, yeah, put man. The stool. shade that you throw is pretty good. I'm impressed. Okay, you said, you said he was short. I just said he was short. You put the man on a stool. Well, <laughs> we got to film this. Movie. We got to film this movie. I don't know how we're gonna do. We got to film this movie. Whatever. We okay. Gotta... Okay. Okay. So Michael B. Jordan would play you with some height. We, we figure just angles. We would figure out angles. Okay. Right. right. All right. Uh, last question. You um. You are reincarnated because you are an animal person. It's perfect. You're reincarnated as any animal. What animal would you choose and why? Mm, that's a good question, too. I've been asked that before, and it changes every time. Okay. Um, but there's something about that good, that something about a lion. <laughs> something about a lion. Right. <laughs> I'm telling you, when you don't have any, when you don't have any enemies, and everybody know what time it is. It's something about that that I like. When you can sleep in the middle of the Serengeti and not worry about nothing, there's something I like about that. You know, no okay. worries. So, um, so it's a, a, definitely a lion. I might have to say lion. I might have to say. Okay. Lion. Hey, I love that. As a Leo, I love that answer. We shall accept that. All right. So, listen, Ricky. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight on the conversation. Thank you for being uh, obviously authentic and very open about your experiences. If you're tuning in late or you came in halfway or caught pieces of it, you can go back and catch the replay on YouTube or on Facebook, the same link that um, that you see or the same link that if you are catching this through Instagram, you can go to the link in the bio. If you're catching it through Facebook, you can catch the link there. And of course, as always, make sure that you go to the website because this will be posted on the website um, and uh, as well as all of our previous episodes. Of course, the website is thecombopodshow.com. That's where this episode will be up there, as, of course, as well as all the previous episodes. Um, I always put up clips because the next two weeks we're going to be doing a best of before my next guest who will be coming up. Um, I'm going to be announcing her tomorrow. Her story is absolutely phenomenal. For those of you local to Charlotte, you, as soon as I say the name, you're absolutely, absolutely going to know who she is, but what she is experiencing now and sharing with her journey is going to be incredible. So make sure also, of course, as I said before, if you're not already following Ricky and Game Ready, make sure you do, do so on Instagram at, and Twitter at Game Ready CLT. And of course, if you need to visit the website um, for you to register your child or to get more information about next week's camp or for personal training, it's GameReadyCLT.com. And of course, 704-931-8596. Thank you so much, Ricky. I so appreciate you and taking the time tonight, Mr. Inferno, Pretty Ricky. Uh, and <laughs> here we go. Here we go. You started here we go. it. And maybe I'll watch a Duke game next year outside of the Duke Carolina game. We'll see. I, I, I could be convinced. I don't know. We'll see. You but listen, be, you will be convinced. Okay. 
awkward pause. <laughs> okay, okay, if you say so. But listen, if anybody, they can, if you want to reach out to him directly, do so at the number. Definitely check out the replay and absolutely share this because your story is absolutely fascinating. And I'm so glad you took the time to share it with us. So thank you so much. Yolanda, thank you for having me. I, I love what you're doing. You know, I'm a true fan and follower. And uh, I mean, I feel honored to be on the show. I hope I was able to do, you know, your show some justice. And you absolutely did. Thank you, my dear. And we will see you all soon, y'all.